All right, my name is Mara Baker. Um, I am an art, on the art faculty here as well as chair of the Visiting Artist Series. Uh, also, I'd like to welcome you to come to the rest of our series as well. Um, it's on our uh, website, so please check that out. We have two more events this year. With that, I'd love to um, introduce Emily Lord as our fourth speaker in our Visiting Artist Series. Emily is a visual and performing artist who combines her love of language, her experiential movement practiced, and the seductive and absurd nature of repetition to create quiet, sparse, and linear works on paper. Her current research explores ideas of place or placelessness, mapping, solitude, and stillness. She received her BA from Bennington College in Sculpture and Dance in 2004, and her MFA in Fiber from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2007. She has been an artist in residence in the Vermont Studio Center, Santa Fe Art Institute, Gentel Artist Residency, and SIM in Reykjavik, Iceland. She has exhibited both nationally and internationally, including Santa Fe, New York, Philadelphia, Reykjavik, and Toronto. Emily is vid visiting us from Brooklyn, New York, where she lives and works. During her visit, she is also auditioning dancers for a long durational performance of Eric Satie's Vexations, debuting here in Chicago on March 15th. Yesterday, Emily led workshops in dance movement and drawing for our students and community members. It was a joy to see our students warm and grow comfortable with movements and gestures in collaboration with each other. Emily encourages her students and viewers to embrace a more expansive idea of what and how drawing happens. Please help me Welcome, Emily, to the College of DuPage. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me here. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with new students, and it's always interesting to me to see how the explorations that I'm really familiar with end up being um, explored in different ways by different makers. I've titled this The Performance of the Line, or When is Drawing, because that's the kind of the heart of what's very interesting to me right now. Um, and has always been in a way and that I am constantly trying to find new ways to combine both my um, performance practice and my drawing practice, how they can inform each other um, or operate together in the same space. I'm gonna talk about what I see lines doing, how I think they operate. I'm gonna show you some of my work. Um, I am usually, uh, my, in my studio practice, I am asking a lot of questions and then the work is about working through towards answers for that, finding that there aren't any, finding that I disagree with myself in the end, et cetera. So um, I've kind of framed this talk today and the work I'm gonna show you as the way that I have answered some of the questions I'm asking now about drawing uh, and that have continued to interest me. So I'm very process driven, I always have been. Um, that's part of kind of my DNA as a maker, the thing that's just always been true of me, um, interested in how things go together and how, um, how things get done. Uh, so the development of a methodology was key in my beginning and the rigor of my practice is, uh, is what sustains the work and connects the dots between ostensibly different fields uh, and different ways of making. One of the things that I do very frequently in my studio is I go to the dictionary. So there are uh, words that come up um, either that describe the work I'm making, that perhaps describe the way, the action I'm actually taking in order to make it, um, that are the feelings I may be trying to portray or the uh, statements I'm making. So I go into the dictionary and I look for new information, kind of mining into those definitions for other ways to make. So an example of what's interesting to me um, currently is line, the noun, you look in the second definition, and it says a length of cord, rope, wire, or other material serving a particular purpose. So serving a particular purpose is very interesting to me because that speaks to uh, performance or functionality. Um, the idea of performance as a whole, not just dance performance or the virtuosic thing occurring on a stage, but really like the um, performative gesture. So the way a thing does a thing is really interesting to me and how that signifies stuff. As I continue to ask questions of myself and kind of make work in a way uh, to answer them, what I'm doing is proposing um, that I can add to these questions of drawing, that I can sort of, um, that the questions being asked of drawing can in fact maybe change to include time and to include uh, performativity. Um, that we can house the discourse of drawing making in the language of performance and therefore unpack it in a different way. Um, 
So that is a little bit what I'm trying to investigate with you today and through the work I'm showing you. What that brings me to is the question, when is drawing? Um, so less interested in perhaps the object of drawing, although of course I'm looking at materials and I'm looking at the way things are put together, um, but when. So there's this sweet spot to me in between the action of making and when the, the, uh, the object happens, when the marks are there, when they arrive. Um, and that space is where we're making choices about what our body's doing and what the marks are um, maybe saying or where they go, uh, quite literally, just some of those compositional choices. But to me, somehow, that's a performance space that I'm interested in discovering. Um, so when I ask these questions, I go usually right back to the dictionary. And if we look at to draw the verb, I pulled out some of the things that are most interesting to me, and I think they're all over the place. Um, so we have eviscerate, but we also have infer, and we also have to write out, uh, to swell out in a wind. Um, these things, the reason this is interesting to me is because there's action embedded in the actual definition of drawing. Um, so can I use these verbs, these other actions, to create um, a performative practice? They give me clues into things I can actually do in the studio um, instead of thinking about what the end result of that, um, that practice is, right? Like the drawing itself. So these actions, if I take these verbs, the ways that drawings can be made, the ways that drawings can perform uh, for us, which I'll talk about a little bit later, these actions can become um, what I'm thinking about as micro performances. Um, so I'm not trying to stage a big event I'm thinking about the making process as um, micro performances or micro events in the, uh, in the making space. And so what that makes me think, when we talk a lot about performance, we talk about the act of performance, but we also have to talk about the space that the performance happens in. Um, can drawing, then, one of my questions is, be the performance space? So I'm asking a lot of these questions, and one of them that has been at the heart of my practice for a very long time is that really big what is drawing question that's been over and over answered. Um, and it remains interesting to me, and I think it's sort of taking the pulse of what's happening in drawing over and over again. Um, so I like to think of that as kind of the umbrella question under which I'm exploring, and helps me answer the when is question a little bit, or connect the dots between performance and drawing. So I start with what makes a drawing, right? And then I'm gonna go through a series of how I might answer this, how I have answered it in work. Uh, if I think what makes a drawing is the line, then I wanna know how a line communicates what it actually does for us. Um, and I'm gonna look at some reference material really quickly, so just kind of keep this stuff in your head. You'll see, I think, where it plays into the drawings later. Um, there are lines all over in our life that we are constantly translating um, and that we very immediately understand because of how we kind of practice um, packing them all the time. So we have this transportation system, um, ways of moving through the world. And so lines are telling us how to get places. It's about movement. I also see that in images like this where we're moving around the world and we're cutting through environments with lines and it's about travel, it's moving out and moving through and moving away from. Um, this kind of, it's very like an activated space with all of this intersection. I spend a lot of times, a time staring at uh, telephone poles and wires. This image in particular is really interesting to me because it's a mess. Um, so instead of that taut linearity from uh, back when I used to work as a production weaver and I was thinking about lines and tension constantly. This one's sort of falling apart and there's lapses in tension and that has a very different energetic feel for me. So I'm thinking about letting go of some of the strict um, tension in my use of line lately and this is an image that helps get there. Another thing that I've been looking at is the way that we graph because there's layers of lines here. So we have the thing we're graphing um, which is outside of this drawing, and then the graph graphic representation, and then the tool, the implement that's making the graph, which is also a physical line, and then this graph paper. So um, it just interests me the way we um, pile all of these lines together sometimes. And then very quickly, in terms of human behavior, um, 
we line up. We do this all the time. There are places that we're supposed to stand and we obey. Um, I have a friend who thinks it's very funny to stand like he's starting a line for something and wait to see if people will just sort of automatically begin to linger behind him in rows. And you'd be surprised at how often people are fooled. Um, it's kind of mean, but also really fascinating uh, study of human behavior and the way that we um, follow orders and follow lines pretty intrinsically. It's in our nature. Um, one of the things that I was interested in studying earlier on in my career was the sort of theories of architecture um, and this idea of wayfinding. So how you can shape space to inform people where to go without putting up a sign that says, hey, go here now. Um, so people are actually looking at lines and, and spaces in order to get information. Um, and what's interesting to me about studying that is the, the way that we can choreograph essentially a crowd by setting up a system of wayfinding um, to direct activity. And I see lines in that in terms of the human behavior of it. Just quickly through a couple other uh, things that I find interesting um, that I think you'll see in some work later. Um, I spend a lot of time photographing where I see lines and patterns and textures and I just sort of keep all that stuff as a log to spend time with. And so I'll just flip quickly through. These are the ones that are interesting to me. The drawing answer to a line, some of these, uh, this drawing in particular was made while in residence um, in Reykjavik. And I was looking a lot at maps. Um, I didn't speak the language, and so I was looking at symbols in my environment to understand where to go and how to get places in those lines that tell me what um, bus to get on and how far to take it. Um, so on a map, there's always the key, uh, which tells you what lines mean what. And I thought, would it, is it possible, and also is it interesting, to um, set up a, a very specific set of lines that are also not giving you any specific information. So I was attempting to, to harness that specificity of a map line without telling you anything or having them actually mean anything. So that was part of that, that kind of look at how lines can, can, can communicate. This was from a series I called Headway Heartland. It was a show of drawings that I brought back to my hometown in northern Maine. Um, and I was thinking about the way that we leave and come back and how we make headway and how there are places we're from that aren't necessarily um, good for us, but that are also on some level comforting because they're the beginning. Um, and I spent a lot of time in the dictionary for the show as a result of that. So this one, this is a detail, I didn't realize I didn't have the larger slide, um, of a drawing called leave. So in the definition for the word leave, um, it says to go out, to leave from here, but it also says to leave that there. So to me, it's, it's two opposite uses of direction. Go out from and leave this here. And so I was thinking about that push-pull relationship of leaving where you're from, um, however complicated where you're from is, it's comfortable in some aspects and the, the way that we leave and we leave parts of ourselves there and we return. Um, and the lines can perhaps communicate that. From that show as well, I dissected all of the um, doorways mainly too, but pieces of the houses I've lived in um, as I grew up and stacked them into this drawing that felt, they don't feel very homey when you pull them apart like this. They have kind of an eerie ghost-like quality and so does that speak to memory um, in that way and place, but also placenessness because you can't enter these spaces. They don't feel particularly welcoming. Lines can describe space and one of the things they can do is also describe emptiness and direction and this drawing is called Sorrow at the Gate. Um, it's uh, certainly uh, abstracted and pulled apart, but I was looking at the way, can I make drawings of spaces that can contain air? So I'm looking up at things and into spaces. This is a graphic essay I made for uh, Knack magazine a couple years ago. Um, and it's my way of telling people why I think drawing is everything and important all the time. Um, because you can follow, so language could, operate in memory and then that points to human trace and that could be a drawing. And human trace could also be about ritual 
which could be for some people about prayer, which could mean something about God, which to me means an abstraction, which points to drawing. So I'm sort of like connecting the things that I think about in the world um, to each other and back again to drawing in terms of behavior and pathways and, and uh, language. This is the way that I sketch a lot. This is not a finished piece, but I like to look at the way layers kind of collide. And I often make very sparse work. So I think a way to loosen up in the studio is to create some densities. So just showing you a part of the practice and the way that lines can also be um, about exploring texture and layer once you um, build them up that far. This drawing is called Fine Point. So it's chalk, um, chalk construction snap line on the wall on a grid, and then I dipped linen thread in ink, and it dried um, so that the ink end was a little stiff, and then I put a hole in the center of every square. Um, really to look at the way I could operate in a grid, which is this traditionally sort of minimalistic way of organizing things, but also have the drawing come out towards me. Um, and so the drawn line, the ink, it dissipates into the end of the white thread. Um, what is that doing? How is that activating space as a drawing still? So the question is what makes a drawing and when is a drawing and what if the answer is the trace? So the trace of things growing, of people putting things here, this is something I've looked at. So this is a design or organization that's being filled in by nature and then my using that to uh, explore composition. Um, and I think sometimes of printmaking as leaving traces because you're sort of acting onto a surface and then letting that surface act again. Um, so that might be a way that there's a performance embedded in this drawing space. One of the things that I think is infinitely fascinating again in the study of architecture is in landscape architecture in particular is this idea of desire lines. So you can design a space as much as you want to, to have this sweeping path that reaches towards the fence, but human beings are about efficiency of energy and getting places on time, and so they will cut through. And so enough human beings cut through, and you generate a new path. And this, in the study of landscape architecture and the way that human behavior operates, is called desire lines. I think of that as a trace, right? So it's a trace of human desire over time in a space. This, I just think it's interesting. This is a Part, uh, my favorite part of the Appalachian Trail in northern New Jersey, and what I like about it is that it's a path that's being, that was built through a marshland. Um, so the opportunity for desire lines does not exist because you don't want to step off into the muck. Um, but if you see the way that it meanders around, I think that the person who designed this path was operating in a sense of desire lines. Like, what would it feel like if you could walk across the surface of a marshland and where would you want to wander to? Traces of activity in nature, just another form of where I'm looking for traces and keeping a digest of what I look at. This is a photo project I did for a while. So I was out in the world with a, um, one of those Polaroid snap printing cameras, uh, looking for textures and lines and repetitions specifically, um, because it was this uh, a rep a rep repetitive act, excuse me. Um, so I was looking for a texture or repetition. I would take a picture of it and then I would leave the picture on the thing I had photographed and take a picture of that to sort of catalog the activity but leave the gesture behind. So it's a trace of me looking at something and exploring something um, and also a way to just find out how else repetition operates. If we go way back, this is some work from grad school I was making uh, embedding thread and handwoven fabric in layers of usually pigmented uh, vinyl compound, and then wet sanding them and pulling it out. So it would reveal layers and leave traces of the threads behind, and the activity was very much kind of also the content of the work, and that's the thing that I was exploring there. It's leaving behind human traces. How is, why is that interesting? Does that connect me to this kind of universal collective of people doing that constantly? And also the word for the, the title of this piece was exhumed, so I buried something and then I exhumed it, right? So it's the action taken to create the work became the content of the work as well. These are more examples of that exploration. So you can see where other layers of pigment and vinyl compound are exposed by pulling things out, the lines that creates. 
and then uh, this thread being left behind because it fell apart, so sort of looking at that. So these are traces, so lines are operating. If what makes a drawing is the fact that I, as a human being, leave a human trace of something behind, a trace of my activity or a gesture, um, then this is a way that I was exploring that. Materials leaving things behind as well. Um, finding things embedded, thinking about how deeply memories can be buried sometimes. This was a performance piece I did at uh, in grad school. So a friend of mine and I, during a performance art gallery exhibition, I delineated the space. You can see the black lines on the floor. That's electrical tape. So I made a path that was a diagonal across the gallery space. And then moving from kneeling to reaching and through walking, we crossed the space, but very, very slowly. Um, so I think it was something like 40 feet, and it took us about an hour and 45 minutes to get across it. Uh, so we were trying to be as slow as possible. And that slowness and that focus and that intensity, so there's a line on the floor. Yes, that's, a, that's the path. But also we left, I think, this energetic path behind us as we were working through. What happened after this, after we were done with this piece that I will always remember because I thought it just was really fascinating is that two people who were at the show went to where we finished and stepped out of the pathway and ran in the opposite direction. And it took a second flat. And I was exhausted from almost two hours of this slow meditative process. And then it, the space that I had generated was just wiped clean by this gesture. And I thought that was incredible. And that's human trace. This reference image is a little bit about how I'm looking at lines and also um, about how I'm finding traces. So I don't, did not have a very particular relationship to this kind of line. This is a, your EKG and your heart rate and where you would monitor your oxygen levels and your um, respirator. So uh, a very dear friend of mine passed away recently and I spent a lot of time with him in the hospital and he was mostly unconscious for that so I became really obsessed with watching his statistics um, so I could know stuff. and I didn't actually know what any of the things meant, but I felt like if I was watching the lines, I would uh, be aware of things. Um, so I created a new and pretty powerful relationship with this set of lines as a result. And what happened then is this series of drawings that I'm working on. So. Um, these are really about trace. This is a set of performance drawings I'll be doing in a show in April in Newark. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about the breath as I was sitting there watching my friend on a respirator and thinking about the how we need that and how easily it can fail um, and how is breathing a performance and is there space in drawing for breathing? Can I make drawings out of breath? Um, so I as an experiment, covered the back of a shirt with powdered graphite, stood against this paper and took a hundred deep breaths. And it left this smudge that on its own, um, it's a little bit unclear how it got there or why it's there, but the gesture of leaving behind the material, so hanging that shirt next to the drawing, is also the trace of me having been there to accomplish that and to meditate around uh, what my breath was doing and how I could leave a mark with it. This is also a part of that series. Um, so I was uh, just finding materials to make things with and found uh, um, like a mask for the respirator and breathing through that onto the drawing where I laid graphite out and then the condensation of my breath kind of stuck it to the page. So I'm thinking about breath and also then water. There's condensation involved in heat. This is also a trace um, from when I dipped all the linen threads into ink in order to stick them into the wall. Um, so it left behind the trace of the ink on this page that I was letting them dry. And so this is one of the places where I start to ask when is drawing. So is drawing when I'm dipping the thread into the ink? Or is it when I lay it out on the sheet of paper and now I have this paper covered in ink and threads? Is it when I take the threads away and now these traces are here? Or is this whole thing actually a um, kind of a series of itself, right? So that each iteration of this same thing is the drawing. That's where I start to get um, 
think really circularly, usually drive myself crazy in the studio because I don't think there is an answer actually, but I think asking the questions is interesting and gets me to some interesting results. Around the idea of breath, I was also thinking about how fragile it is. Um, and so I wanted to disturb a drawing in some way around that. I uh, made drawings with graphite and charcoal and then I drowned them and then I watched them dry. So um, is the drawing when I'm making marks on a surface, is the drawing when I'm holding it underwater? Uh, is the drawing any point of that drying process because it changes visually? Is it the remnants afterwards? Is it my need to destroy something in a really precious way? What does that say about me? Like, um, I don't know, and I think that's where I'm interested in investigating where the drawing ends up. And I've discovered that drawings can perform as well, so I don't necessarily have to be doing that work. And one of the ways it did this um, is, so I started making drawings with um, the chalk that you use in the construction snap lines. And the reason for that is that it doesn't really ever embed into a surface. Um, it dries very quickly and unevenly. Um, it gets very muddy when you add water to it, and, so, and it also stains. So. I was making drawings with that, um, and then I would hang them up to look at them and let them dry. And um, they would crumble and flake and fall on the floor. And I discovered this because I actually heard the pieces of the drawing hit the floor and shatter and turned around. And so that the, that the drawing was acting out something and performing essentially a new drawing onto a new surface became very interesting to me. And so I started to set this up on purpose um, to let it happen. It happens more over time, so more material gets on the floor. So again, is the drawing my gesture with the material? Is the drawing part of it drying? Is the drawing that surface, once everything that's going to flake off has, is it as things fall and the sound they make when they crash and fall apart? Uh, is it this new drawing in this space and then I'm disrupting the um, permanency of visual art in a sense because the drawing made on the floor is going to need to get swept up at some point. So I'm no longer interested in that archival process around visual art. The other way I could answer the question what makes a drawing and when is a drawing is um, that what makes a drawing is the gesture. So I have different ways of interpreting what a gesture is. One of them, um, and it was sort of a little bit of a joke, but uh, I made a series of drawings, I think I called them proposals for unintended activity. So this, for example, is called tie. It's a proposal to tie a piece of string to every blade of grass in a four by four foot square. Um, and I did not do that, but I intended to, and I made a sketch about it. Um, so what is a gesture into the world? Is it an intention? Is it actually an activity? Is it all of the prep work, like in the artist life, all of the prep work and the proposals and the sketches I do, or is it the, actually the thing? Um, or is it all of that stuff somehow? This is a, just some video footage shot from an experiment when I was a resident at Vermont Studio Center. Um, I was looking at repetition. All of these little pieces of paper stuck to the wall have little birds on a telephone wire drawn on them. And then I was still operating in this knee jerk um, compositional structure of needing to put things in grids. Um, so that was the impulse there. And then I was playing around with what they do and noticed that with this fan on them, they were really kind of fluttering and flying away and doing bird-like things. Um, so the installation had this moving quality to it, this gesture about it, uh, but it was referring to the image on the little piece of paper, which was hard to see. Um, and this is just footage of us playing around in the studio with it, discovering what else it does, um, and being willing to, in exploration, explorations like this, to, it took me a very long time to put 600 little pieces of paper in a grid on the wall, and then about eight minutes for it to disappear. So having the willingness to um, let those things happen, I think, is important in process. This is a sketch for um, some kind of idea I had about how movement and a physical line could be a drawing in space and what that might look like and how a repetition of it um, 
could maybe leave traces in your memory of how you experienced that, and that was the line of the drawing. Um, this is, my, is footage of my asking that question in a couple of different ways with this piece of silk. And thinking about how the drawing materials can be different. So drawing material in this sense is a piece of silk and um, the influence on it is the wind and I am actually somehow this intermediary force between the drawer, the wind, and the material, the silk. So one of the things I want to say about these questions I'm asking, I should say these there, is that they don't need an answer, um, that I don't think an outcome is particularly important, uh, certainly not to me in a process-driven practice. Um, and then the other thing I think about these questions is that the answer for me in this current moment is when the performance begins. So when is the drawing? When does the drawing occur? What constitutes a drawing? And I think that comes down to the, um, those micro performances I was talking about. So drawing being a space for performance or performativity. Not necessarily, again, the big dance show, but the uh, ability to perform something against something else and that definition of the line um, uh, the, that serves a particular purpose, right? If you think about when the drawing is, what you're asking really is what is the criteria for understanding the um, performance as a drawing space. So I've just flipped that around, right? Instead of drawing being uh, the site for performance, how is performance um, a space for drawing to be contained? The way that I think these two things combine is this. What happens in dance spaces is that we're using time. Things exist in time. They disappear when they're over. Um, movement can accumulate over time and we can remember it, but it's up to us, the viewer, to hold all of those things together. And then they disappear when the dancers are gone. But what happens in drawing spaces is that we have a record, we have a mark. So um, we're thinking about permanence or some, whatever permanence means because things fall apart anyway. Uh, we're looking at memory. We can layer things up. I can put all of the things I mean onto one surface and you'll see them at the same time versus over time. And so these two things seem like they're, they are in fact operating very differently and they could be spaces to hold the other's activity, I think. We covered some of that in the workshops yesterday around how to translate movement into drawing and then um, back again a little. This is another dance film sketch. I did a series of dance sketches um, every week for a year and this was one, this one I'm showing in particular because it's a nod to the Tom Marioni piece, drawing a line as far as I can reach, where he sat and drew up in a vertical um, as far as he could reach. And the drawing was really about that activity, as far as I'm concerned about that activity, and about the human reach of the, of the person doing that. And so this was um, kind of my dance answer to it. I had a chalk line and some, some thread I was manipulating in the space. This is a series of graphic scores for dance. So I made drawings that used um, deconstructed dance notation symbols and the, the structure of that. So in dance notation, typically you read from bottom to top, left to right. So I used that as a formula for getting the marks on the page. I had some of my own rules too about how the thickness of a line might translate into the, uh, how much weight or energy in your body you were using, things like that. So the dancers had all of this information and then uh, performed them in the show. So there, it's, it's a nonspecific um, communication of ideas because there's only so much I can embed in the notation and then it becomes a, an improvisation. So each person's interpretation of the graphics score was different. But that's operating between both of those spaces. Um, that compressed space of drawing where I can contain everything and then everything that that drawing is containing moved out into a time-lapse space. Just to go back for a minute, this is one of the drowned drawings and um, I took a lot of photographs of them while they were drying um, to just see where the, the drawing was kind of performing itself, performing new iterations of itself as it uh, dried. And then the accidents that I like to look at, so I spilled something. But I had spilled something while making drawings that were spilling themselves onto the floor. And so 
I thought, okay, I just did the same thing. And what's the mark that I made? Um, is this a complete drawing? Um, not as much as the drawings I'm making that are falling apart, but it's part of the process of discovering how those drawings operate. The last series I want to look at, and that's uh, uh, for a show in August, just have one time, um, is this idea of how, not what. So I did this with students in workshops yesterday. Um, it's a choreographic notion from Susan Rethorst that uh, you can think about how you're moving things in space and composing space, not exactly what those things are. So the how becomes precious and important, and the what secondary. Um, the game she suggests that I did with students yesterday was to have random objects from your bag or your pockets and sit with someone and uh, one by one take turns just placing the object and then replacing and moving and rearranging. And so what you're doing is, is playing a game and it feels kind of easy and light and silly, but you're also in the middle of studying how you function compositionally and how you react to other people's choices in that way. Um, and reacting to other people's choices is a pretty key thing when you're uh, learning to dance improvisationally because there are other bodies in the space. So the series I'm working on, or the other way that I'm answering all of these drawing questions right now, is to create surfaces. So I'm playing this um, compositional game with myself, essentially, with random studio materials, <clears throat> little pieces of things, things that are leaving marks behind. Um, and sometimes there are objects that will fall when I pick the surface up. The goal really is for me to look at the way things continue to relate to each other over time and how they leave marks or I put something down that's covered in ink and when I slide it over it leaves a mark. Um, and then these become just surfaces that are containing traces. I think these are containing kind of all the things I'm thinking about because there are lines here that are communicating information. There are found materials. There are traces of human activity. Um, there are gestures into the space. This has physical objects on it. I took a photograph of it before I picked it up, before it fell apart. And there it is. So those are the traces of the activity. So the show um, is, is attempting to make these surfaces um, the drawings so that the, the activity is this game that I play with myself, but the, the surface and the trace of that game is where the drawing is contained. Um, and then in the show, so I'm cataloging all of the objects I use for each of these surfaces, and there will be museum-like cases where uh, of those things will be archived so you can sort of see it's like the the history of the surface playing around with the way museums um, talk about history and remnants and fragments um, and that is the work I mean to show you I have this photograph um, so it's replaced sort of exciting and not exciting at the same time it replaced one I was using for a long time in lectures uh, there was an experiment I did in my studio in Vermont Studio Center um, that uh, failed terribly and was super boring. And so I took a picture of it and I thought, why not? This is part of the process. We have to fail, we have to ask questions, we have to be willing to try something that's not gonna work. Um, and I called it the most anticlimactic thing I'd done to date. And so um, unfortunately or fortunately, I have now done a more anticlimactic thing and it's this. And that's just to point to practice again and remind you to fail and try stuff and let things not work. So that is that. And then that quick reminder to keep making and keep doing things. OK? I have two questions regarding your drowned drawings. Mm -hmm. What paper did you do that on? And then once the paper was underwater, did you manipulate it? Mm -hmm. Good questions. So I experimented with papers for a while. I had a bunch of watercolor paper, which while it survived, um, didn't fail in some interesting ways like other, other papers did. So it depended a little bit on what I wanted. Um, did I want the drawing to really contain its body or in other ways the paper was really shredding and falling apart? Um, 
and it was a larger failure, but a different experiment. So the thing for that that really worked for me was the watercolor paper, because I wanted to look at drowned and then drying, but not, not falling apart. Water paper versus the heavier weight. Mm -hmm. Light, much lighter. Light, uh, no, I would say on that scale, around 40. And then once it was underwater, did you manipulate it? I mean, in terms of... Uh... No. So I just held it there, kind of a cruel fashion. But, um, and then also it was an interesting decision. Do I pick it up through the water or do I turn it up vertical? Because that changed the way um, the water continued to destroy the mark. Um, if you put ink on the paper as well as charcoal, there are different results there. Yeah. And then, of course, the drying process um, uh, rumples things a little bit. The lighter the paper weight, the more you get that kind of movement, which then pools water, which is how I think the drying takes longer and becomes that performative thing. Did you also try the drawing board, you know, the, the, the board that... Uh... I did not try that, yeah. I did want a little, a, a little instability involved, yeah. As far as the performance... Part of your practice. Was that something you're always interested in? Or what was your introduction to that? Right. Um, yes and no, was I always interested in it. So when I was an undergrad, I was a double major in dance and sculpture, and um, at the time, pretty convinced that they related to each other because I was building things that have bodies and relate to bodies in space, and I was also a body choreographing in space. Um, but I hadn't fully articulated those things. And I was very committed to dance, dance the practice of making beautiful things. Um, and I think that's a, um, a preciousness that I let go of at one point so that performance could not necessarily be a virtuosic thing. Um, and then in research since that, looking into performance studies and the larger idea of um, how we perform daily um, in our human rituals and the ways that we interact with people and in, in different um, types of spaces, performativity, um, that changed how I looked again at it. So I no longer needed to make something in a theater. I could just really think about um, purpose and activity. Um, I'm a music student here, and we just began kind of uh, learning about music meditation. Mm -hmm. And we started learning about gratitude and thanks. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering how you went about that, like, using it for Right, good question. I spent a long time studying that stuff. And into the, um, there's a longer history of graphic scores for music than there is for dance, as there is a longer history of notation in music than there is dance, and musical notation is much more um, uh, formulated and followed. Um, so I definitely looked at a lot of those graphic scores for music as a way to understand how to create them for dance. There is now a pretty large body, art historically, of choreographers working in that way within the last, I think, 25 years or so. Um, maybe 30 at this point, but thinking about how, what's interesting to me about that work is the translation moment because it's a non-specific way of communicating information and the result is going to vary. And so in what, how much variance am I willing to deal with? And in what way do I want to make information available? Um, and how much instruction am I going to give to the performer? Right, so the, the piece that I showed you, the performers had pretty clear instruction about what things meant, um, but there was no time signature and there was no spatial arrangement. Um, so I think it depends on what your, the goal of the performance is, but I really love the way that these things can kind of talk back and forth to each other. I don't know if that understand, uh, answers your question. I studied dance notation for a while too, and it's interesting because it's this sort of really compressed and ugly graphic um, thing that doesn't feel like doesn't feel like a gesture drawing. It doesn't feel like a moving thing, um, but it describes the rite of spring, right? And it's sort of a, it's an odd compression in between that space of drawing and that space of uh, dance, like I was talking about. Thank you.